This video is brought to you by Gigabyte's Aorus gaming laptops, such as the fantastic Aorus 17G. Throughout the Black Friday period, Gigabyte are offering Australian customers up to $1,000 discounts on new Aorus and Aero models with NVIDIA graphics, making them even better buys for gamers and content creators on the go. On top of that, select customers will be eligible for neat bonuses like free SSDs, Netflix gift cards, and even a lucky draw raffle for one of three Gigabyte gaming monitors. There's no better time to buy an Aura 17G or other Gigabyte laptop, so check out the links in the description to learn more. Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. This is part two, the unexpected part two of our Radeon 6000 series Q&A. If you missed part one, uh, go back, that should already be on the, the channel now, which you can check out. Uh, but yeah, it turns out that we talked through some questions for about two hours and there were way more questions than we expected. Lots of stuff, really interesting discussion. So we're just going to get right into the second half of the questions now. And yeah, that's pretty much it. We've already done all the question work. So yeah, enjoy the rest of the Q&A. Actually, before we do, we've been going for like an hour or so and I've just realized I haven't, I don't know. What am I sitting on? What box am I on this time? Oh, that's right. Um, so you've got the Viotech monitor, the 4K one. Um, oh, nice. You did a little bit okay. of height though. So you're just... I've put you on a peasant quality uh, GTX 1650 super box because <laughs> that was the okay, perfect well, height. Um, yeah, Gigabyte okay. is, yeah, I guess in, in the video as well at the moment. But yes, it is a, a nice GTX 1650 super for you. <laughs> as, as long as it's an NVIDIA GP, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get into it. <laughs> Next question. With seemingly how RX 6000 reference design GPUs are limited launch day things only, uh, emails being sent saying it was so from retailers. RTX 30 series FE designs being that too. What is the point of them and the FPS per dollar for day one reviews? Is that just pointless now? Um, hmm. I'm sure you have a few thoughts on this, but... <laughs> <laughs> go, You go first, Tim. Uh, well, there's, there's still a point to them because I guess even though AIB cards, generally speaking, are more expensive than sort of the reference designs at the MSRP, we do over time see more budget cards come out filling that spot. Maybe not a 2080 oh. Ti where that card was just $1,200 most of the time, but we've seen it 5700 XTs, 2070s, 2080s. You do get board partner cards, custom designs that come down to the same price. So I think there's still a point there. Is that sort of what how you'd see it? Yeah, 100%. Totally agree with that. Like for a brand like MSI, for example, typically the Ventus cards... Uh, maybe the Ventus non-OC. So usually from MSI, the Ventus is your base model. You get like a Ventus OC that's $10, $20 over the MSRP, depending on the price range. And then you'll get a Gaming X Tro, which is sort of your Strix class type card that's usually... Uh, I don't have the prices off the top of my head, but for an RTX 3070, I imagine the Ventus model would be your $500. Ventus OC would be about $520. And then the Gaming X Tro would be 560, 575, 580, somewhere in that range. So we, we always get MSRP cards, or we, well, we usually always get MSRP cards. And in the case of the 2080 Ti, as you pointed out, that didn't really happen. It was very rare that you got one at the MSRP. And I think well after launch, it pretty much didn't happen. So that's something we'll be on the lookout for. A lot of people are complaining about you know cards not available at the MSRP. Well, cards aren't available, period. So getting one at the MSRP, it's just, that, yeah, that's not going to happen at the moment if you can't buy them. There are cards listed, like 3070s, 3080s, 3090s. They're listed at the MSRP. They're just out of stock. Yep. So we've talked about this at length. The real test will be sometime in 2021, February, I don't know, somewhere around there, when they start to get stock, what are they selling for? And then I was going to say six months, but that may be too early. But let's say mid-product cycle, if they're not, sell it when they're in stock if they're not selling the msrp then we've got another 2080 ti situation on our hands where the msrp was a fake review type price and once cards were re readily available they weren't achieving the msrp so hopefully that's not a case with the ampere gpus it's something we'll have to monitor i'm fully expecting the rdna2 gpus uh, to sell at the msrp very shortly when they're in stock so hopefully again that is the case but it's just something we'll have to monitor and keep updating you guys yep. on Okay, quick one here. Hardware Canucks, 6800 XT sample had serious coil wine. Did yours? No, no coil wine at all from either of my samples. My 6800 XT or my 6800, both were very quiet. Uh, you'll get a little bit of, 
coil wine type noise when you're talking about three, four hundred FPS or more. Uh, that sort of that squealing sound, but not horrendous coil wine. So maybe they got a bit of a dud there. That can happen. But yeah, no, nothing out of the ordinary. Again, we sort of mentioned it with the 3090 when the 3090 was rendering like 500 FPS in, I think it was Rainbow Six Siege. It was squealing a bit, uh, but that's sort of to be expected when you're pumping out 500 FPS. But anyway, no coil wine to report with my 6800 XT sample. All right, I've got a question specifically targeted to me, apparently. Tim, in the 6800 XT review, Steve stated that NVIDIA has squandered the lead from Pascal in a very Intel-like way. I can't decide if I agree with that take. Convince me that he's right or that sleep deprivation simply got the better of him. So I think you're probably... Steve's comment is probably talking about more the Turing generation, sort of mm. having a lead with Pascal, then sort of stagnating with Turing and then really needing mm. to accelerate with Ampere, which is kind of what Intel's faced with Turing being sort of the Skylake plus, 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 plus situation. So I think that's probably an, an accurate point. I guess if NVIDIA had sort of done the Turing generation at a really affordable price point and then Ampere at even more affordable than they're doing now, then potentially they would be accelerating their lead even further beyond and AMD would be really struggling to compete. On the other hand, though, it sounds like their production costs on an Ampere GP were still pretty high. So mm -hmm. I guess even if like Turing was a more impressive generation, then potentially we'd still be seeing a pretty similar sort of thing with Ampere. Maybe they'd target more like a TSMC 7 nanometer than Samsung 8 nanometer or potentially try and make a more affordable GPU or something along those lines. So I guess it kind of works in both ways, doesn't it? It's like they did sort of squander the lead and could have pushed further ahead, but there are also a number of concerns with Ampere that probably meant that what we're getting is kind of what we're getting, I guess. So I think... Yeah, and I didn't... Sorry, I, just say, I didn't mean to imply that it's exactly what Intel did. Yeah, yeah. Because we're, we're talking about one generation, not like six or seven or whatever it ended up being. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I just meant in the, in the sense that Turing improved things in terms of cost per frame by nil. Yeah, that's right. Like there was no improvement it, it there. Didn't, it didn't take the market any further ahead in the high end at all. No, like it was just no. basically let's sell more expensive cards. We've talked about all that stuff before. I don't want to rehash our true <laughs> criticism too much in a video about um, RDNA 2. But yeah, I think, yeah, that's basically it. It's good to see AMD coming back in the market and competing with an Ampere product. But yeah, it's kind of AMD lagging behind as much as NVIDIA sort of squandering their things with with uh, the yeah. Pascal and Turing generation. So, yeah, let's move it'd on. Certainly be, yeah, it'd certainly be an exaggeration to say that they're the same thing. No, That's NVIDIA's it's... been far better at executing than Intel <laughs> over the last five years. I think if, yeah. if, we're, if we're saying yeah. NVIDIA's done an Intel, that is very unfair to NVIDIA, who have been yeah. certainly doing quite a lot of impressive stuff. Yeah, so. I was using the Intel like very loosely. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that it is all right for AMD and NVIDIA to compete with their AIB partners? With reference designs getting better, the recent series, uh, it's only a matter of time till the conflict of interest becomes clear. Um, yeah, it's a re that's a really interesting topic, and I think it's going to become more of a more of an issue over time. Um, it's interesting because obviously AMD can or Nvidia can effectively buy their own GPU dies and boards for cost price, whereas if they're selling it to an AOB, obviously they want to charge a margin there, which means that the AOB if they're targeting the same overall graphics card price, means they have less of a margin to make a cooler or board design or power or whatever. And that could potentially be an issue. And Well, oh, sorry. I thought you No, I, I'm sorry, basically I, finished. I, Go on. I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to jump in and cut you off. I was just going to say, when you said it could potentially be an issue, well, yes and no, because as we've just talked about, those cards don't stay in the channel for that long. Yeah, that's right. That's not the point of them. Also... I don't think it's an issue at all. I think it's actually of great benefit to not just NVIDIA and AMD, but also you guys. Because the 5700 XT, perfect example. The reference card featured a cooler that wasn't particularly heavy. It was a blower-style cooler that pretty much none of you want to buy and none of the AIBs offered on their premium models. So it's not a very good reference. And then you get a situation where the reference card is very hot and loud, and then you get AIB cards that are all over the place. Some of them were really crap and basically as bad as the reference card. And then others were 
somewhere in between and some were significantly better. I think having a really good baseline, a really good point of reference is where you want to start because then there really should be no reason, well, there is no reason for AIBs to make a card that runs hotter and louder than the reference card. If that happens, it's an epic fail. They'll get smashed for it and rightfully so. All the AIB, the XFX, Sapphire, Power Color, the cards that you're probably going to see first, I expect they all will be better than the reference card, and they absolutely should be. So, but you can't charge a premium for a product that is worse. Just- no. So my point is, it's it's less of a gamble. Fifty seven hundred XTs. It's like the MSI Evoke, uh, the the original XFX cards with the cooler, the ASUS Strix, the ASUS Tough. All of those cards were pretty crap and really not much better or in some ways worse than the reference card. Uh, But the reference card set the bar so low, it's debatable. But the point is by setting the bar so much higher with these current Founders Edition cards and these current uh, new reference cards from AMD, your chances of going out and buying one straight away, your chances of getting a dud are much lower. It's it's unlikely to happen. I expect that we're going to see... I, I, don't, I honestly don't expect we'll see a bad 6800 series graphics card from AIB, so I expect them all to be exceptional because A, they probably have learned their lesson, and B, AMD has set the bar so high for them. Yeah. Which, but not, not so high they can't exceed it. Because yeah, again, right. we're talking about, in the case of the RTX 3080 and the case of uh, the 6800, we're talking about dual slot cards. So you put a big triple slot cooler on there, there's no way you're losing to a dual slot card. It's not going to happen. So they've set the bar high, but certainly not to an impossible level. Where the bar was set foolishly was something like an RTX 3090, the card that's sitting on the shelf behind me. That's just, you know, a sand brick of a graphics card. The thing's huge. And for an AIB to offer anywhere near that kind of cooling performance, that anywhere near the MSRP, is just not going to happen. That's a, a significantly premium product. So for NVIDIA to offer that, as a base reference MSRP product, yes, I agree that's not great for their partners. But again, is that card even going to be available again? Like, yeah, who knows? But was it really even a real product? So anyway, they're my thoughts on that. I think there has to be at least some compromise if AMD and NVIDIA are, comp- are competing with the AIB. So it has to be either they're giving you know their partners a very favourable price or effectively charging mm. themselves money or somehow... Or I think what's actually happening is the compromise is in availability. So mm-hmm. basically, as we've been talking about, these cards, while they do compete for a period of time, they don't compete with them long term. So you see people buying them initially, and then over time, really, it's mostly just the focus on the AMD cards or AIB cards. So um, I think that's where the where it becomes okay. So that you know, in three months, most of the cards are AIB cards. It would be a much more significant problem if throughout the entire launch period and entire time that these cards are available, you can just go straight to nvidia.com and buy yourself a 3080, no troubles whatsoever. So Mm -hmm. I think by restricting the supply of these cards, that's kind of where they're allowing the AIBs to sort of do most of the work and not really piss them off or not really conflict with them too much. And it does all those benefits you've been talking about where you're you're setting the standard so we don't get more tough gpus where they're not even cooling the memory and that sort of thing um Mm -hmm. they're setting the they're setting the right standard and then that allows the aibs to continue that on when in the rest of the market after a period of time so yeah yeah basically if it's going to be available for a limited time only and it's a realistically achievable level of performance then it's fine again i think the 3090 overstepped there but i think the 3080 and the 6800 and the 6800 XT are perfectly acceptable because I think the AIBs can match or beat those cards while still making their regular margin. Yeah, and for, so, the, for the 3090, you can totally understand why they did what they did. It's a $1,500 GPU. You want to make sure you're getting, even when you buy an NVIDIA card, like a really good product. So potentially yeah, the, the solution the there was is, not make AIB cards. Well, yeah, because that's the problem. The AIBs need to make their margin, and there's no way they can offer a 2 kilo cooler and still meet the MSRP because yeah. NVIDIA's not selling the chip to them at a price where they can afford to do that, is my understanding. Yeah. Obviously, I haven't been given exact numbers, but anyway. All right, next question here. I'll ask it here as many AMD marketing will hear it regarding not paper launch, uh, where four days after release. 
can you search for you can't search for RX 6800 and find any listings in stores, no pre-order, back order, pricing, nothing. Isn't that exactly what you'd call a paper launch? Well, people have bought them. So it's not a paper launch, but at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, it's not really the proper launch either. The proper launch will take place on the 25th. So... Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. It's <laughs> it's as close to a paper launch as you can get without can. being a paper launch. Because a paper yeah, launch is more more like your, your Cascade Lake X situation where... It just doesn't go on sale. It's, it's on sale and reviewers have tested the products and they sort of... The product exists in some form, but no one can buy it. So basically yeah. they're just saying, hey, this thing exists... Um, yeah, we're done. <laughs> Whereas with this, these launches and the Ampi launch as well, some people have been able to buy it. So I think if there was a situation where it came to the 18th, we tested the products and then there was literally no stock. It wasn't available. There was just pre-orders being taken for some date in the future. That is a paper launch, 100% paper launch. But as soon as you start selling cards, it becomes not a paper launch. But at the same time, that doesn't, solve the problem it's not like no. labeling it not a paper launch makes it all okay it's just that i guess by the definition it's not it's certainly a poor launch in terms of availability there's no doubt about that it would have been great to see more availability but paper launch probably not yeah and i sort of i've talked about this a few times are you surprised by any of this not not like, really is, is, not really if if like, if I had said to you, the RX 6800 series is going to launch, it's going to be sold out basically instantly, and it's going to be very difficult to purchase for weeks after release. And you'd be like, yeah, that that sounds like <laughs> a like, GPU launch. What, you're telling me that, there's a different reality in where GPUs yeah. don't sell out immediately for an in-demand product? It It's kind of bizarre that we have... This happens every time, like, people have goldfish memories or something. I mean, I'm not... Don't mean to be rude here or talk down to anybody or whatever, but it's like this happens every single time. And yeah, it's frustrating and annoying every single time. It's just that's what happens. Like we saw it with Vega, Vega 64, 56. You could say that was cryptocurrency mining, which, yeah, fair enough. Go back further. RX 480. That's a mid range, affordable part. AMD did create a bit of hype when they showed it, like, matching a GTX. What was it? 1080. Oh, the dual crossfire, crossfire testing. Oh. In, in um, Ashes of the Benchmark. So that, that was all... That marketing hype created a lot of excitement around that product because people thought they were getting $500 US NVIDIA performance for, like, $200 from AMD when, in fact, that wasn't the case at all. But the point is, the RX 480, it's $200 to $240, depending on VRAM configuration. That card had no availability for over a month. Like, you just couldn't buy it. And then it was like two months before we saw the very first AIB cards. Eight yep. weeks, two months. Like, I'm not exaggerating. It was at least that long. So we're talking three months before you could buy an RX 480. <laughs> and and we've seen that for pretty much every launch since. Like, even the, the 5700 series had poor availability initially. Like, we've, we've seen it time and time again. The RX 480 was particularly bad, but we've said it multiple times in Q&As and stuff like that. You really shouldn't expect to be able to go out and read, readily uh, purchase one of these new GPUs for like two months. And that, I think we agreed that I, I cut off our deadline for, for getting there, for ca get, basically getting the supply to catch up to the demand is about two months. Like once you get beyond that point, it's ridiculous and you're sort of looking at a failed product launches which is what we've been talking about with ampere yeah so, i think it's it's a situation where you want to make sure that at least i'd say after a month you need to start be getting fairly substantial resupplies so yeah. that we're not like getting 10 cards again per week like yeah by the one month period people who wanted one day one and have placed pre-orders we should be getting through the bulk of those sales within the first month mm -hmm. because due to consistent but still low supply potentially restocking of the cards and then two months later that really needs to be the point where 
a lot of the time, if you wanted one, you can go into a store or go online and buy one because they're just mm -hmm. available. So mm -hmm. I think with Ampere, we're at the situation where we're like what six weeks beyond and we're not getting consistent resupply. So that's very concerning. And then we'll see what happens with the um, this 6000 series launch from AMD as to what point we start seeing, you know, people that want to one day one, how many weeks did they have to wait until they can buy that card? Uh, that's really the tell. I think with this launch in particular, while supply is very poor, <laughs> um, demand is also ridiculous. And, and there's so many factors there. Obviously, the pandemic situation has caused PC gaming to become much more popular than it's ever been. But on top of that, it's not just that. It's like the GPU market has been terrible for two to three years now due to things like the Turing situation where we didn't see in the high end any significant price to performance gains. So you're not just getting people on Turing wanting to upgrade, you're getting people who have got 1080 Ti's wanting to upgrade, 1080's, 1070's, all jumping on this generation of GPUs. So it's it's been this enormous compounding of factors where supply is awful, especially awful for Ampere and bad for this, and we'll see how that goes. Pandemic situation, so PC gaming people are getting into, and then the worst GPU market that we've seen for years. So this situation is not surprising. And as we were I, talking about, people really should have been... I think I think some people were reasonably expecting this, but you still always get the sort of impatient people out there and, and those sort of people that wanted their 6800 or 3080 immediately and were expecting to be able to get it day one to play Cyberpunk or whatever. The reality is you're probably going to be playing Cyberpunk on your last-gen GPU. That's just what's happening. Yeah. And you do see a lot of unreasonable people let's say and maybe they don't, they don't mean to be unreasonable it's just uh, a situation where they don't fully understand the situation and that leads them to be unreasonable i see a lot of people saying this should be illegal they shouldn't be allowed to do this they should have to ensure a certain level of supply before they can launch the product and so on and so forth and it's like well i agree and that cuts into the frustration it's also you've got to be aware of the bigger picture and i'm going to grossly simplify it but basically, they start making GPUs, and then AIB's partners buy those, so the money's spent, and now they have to recoup that money. And it's not just them, so then distributors buy them in volume, and now they're potentially even a small distributor, hundreds of thousands of dollars out of pocket, and then they've got to sell them on to retailers, so that you can't sort of say, okay, we're going to... Basically, NVIDIA can't build up a huge inventory and then start flooding the, the channels either. I mean, that would that would work out better. But it's not a situation where they can start making cards, selling them to turn a profit, and then have distributors hold on to them until launch day or whatever. And there have been some uh, products where they bought them a month ahead of time, and I've spoken to retailers, and they're like, yeah, we're 200000 let's say, dollars out of pocket right now, and we can't sell these for another four weeks. So you can't really create regular situations like that either where they're constantly tying up huge amounts of money. So they, that's why they get leaked out. This will drip fed, let's say. Yeah. I mean, the, the simple reality with that is, is do you want a small group of people to be able to buy a, let's say, RTX 3080 right now and for the next couple of months and then have some angry customers and then later you'll be able to buy one? Or do you want no one to be able to buy a 3080 in these months and everyone to be able to buy one later. It doesn't change at all. It's either we yeah. launch the card in September and a few people can buy it and then hopefully by January or February lots of people can buy it or we just launch it in January or February. There's no situation realistically where there was going to be hundreds of thousands or millions of these units available at the launch time. And mm -hmm. yes... It's very frustrating for people. It sucks. It would be great if there was supply. But to me, I would actually rather have at least some people be able to buy these cards in a limited capacity for a few months than have everyone forced to wait more time than is necessary. So obviously there, There's they so many reasons for yeah, that as well. Yeah, and the, the, because, as you said, there's so many reasons. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many reasons. And again, like I agree with you for wanting that because... Basically, you're in some ways paying to be a guinea pig. You're amongst the first people to get these cards and start using them in games. And then there's perhaps stability issues or there's things aren't rendering correctly or the, you know, there's compatibility problems and they get sort they might get sorted out before 
mainstream consumption. So there's a, there's a whole host of reasons, but yeah, yep. basically, as we often say, it's best just to be patient. So next question. So NVIDIA launched ray tracing with terrible performance. Then it was found there is no real performance per core improvement going from Turing's RT cores to Ampere's. Now AMD's ray tracing implementation is out in the world and it performs even worse than NVIDIA's implementation that is over two years old. How did AMD think this was an acceptable level of performance in 2020 and is ray tracing doomed to be a massive FPS hit forever? Um, well, I mean, from AMD's perspective, it's kind of a first generation product. So they're getting into the ray tracing market. So they're kind of just doing what they can. Is it acceptable in the market? Probably not, but let's be honest. I mean, they've got to start somewhere. Is ray tracing doomed to be a massive FPS hit forever? I think there's always going to be some level of performance hit. Like, let's be honest, it's not going to be you turn ray tracing on and get the same level of performance. It's like any quality setting, it's always going to come with a performance hit. But the reality is that NVIDIA and AMD's GPUs are not very capable of ray tracing right now. Even NVIDIA's Ampere designs is a massive performance hit and not really suitable for what people are trying to do in games when it comes to ray tracing. So, you know, we've talked, we've done recently some polls about what people are you know, for example, what, they're, what are they preferring at the moment? Is it rasterization or ray tracing performance? And it was something like 78% of people, I think, preferred rasterization mm-hmm. performance. And there were lots of comments and stuff on that on that poll with a lot of people saying stuff like the quality just isn't there for the performance hit. And yeah, okay, NVIDIA probably should be selling their cards a little bit cheaper based on the ray tracing performance difference. Again, we've done another poll showing people, I think most people saying either... 5 to 9% cheaper or 10 to 20% cheaper based mm-hmm. on the current ray tracing performance difference. So people do want better ray tracing performance and do think that if performance is lower, that it should come at a cheaper cost, which is mm-hmm. 100% fair. Reasonable. And we're talking about two products with otherwise the same you know, performance in standard rasterization. But people, it seems, aren't placing that much value in ray tracing right now. So while you say in this question stuff like, it's even worse, how is this acceptable, all that sort of thing. We're in the infancy of this. We're still very young, even though NVIDIA stuff's been out for two years, we're still very, very early on, and quite clearly people in the market are placing some value on ray tracing, but not a significant amount. So I think AMD was sort of betting, well, for our first generation thing, this is what we can do. We'll try fix this in the future. We'll improve performance. We'll iterate on it, but we'll get it out there now and really sell the card on what people want to buy now, which is rasterization performance and that sort of thing. Um, But we've been talking a lot about this offline. We can go back and forth on this potentially, but it's going to be next gen, the future generations, three generations down the line where ray tracing becomes a significant reality. And it's just right now, the hardware level support is not there. It's not there in NVIDIA. It's not there in AMD. It's going to be years for this. Yeah, the the bit about... Is it always going to be, you know, a big, a massive FPS hit forever? I think you, uh, a long time ago, when we were talking about ray tracing when we were making our dedicated videos over a year ago, you likened it to multi-sampling AA, so yep. MSAA. And basically, for those gamers that are a little more mature in our audience, you'll remember when jaggies were a thing. It was just something you lived with and... The the way to reduce them as best you could was to increase the resolution, but games used to have horrible jaggies everywhere, like a wire was just this mess, and that, that was how games were, and then we got anti-aliasing, and that improved it massively, except initially, obviously we've got different methods of AA now, which has also helped significantly, but you can use MSAA uh, to a reasonably high degree now, and, and it's very playable, but initially... To, to get rid of the jaggies, the performance hit was just too extreme. The, the stills looked fantastic, but the gameplay was horrible. The performance hit was just so massive that people weren't interested in using anti-aliasing initially. It was kind of like a ray tracing type thing. Some people argued it was worth the performance hit because the visuals were better. Similar kind of argument, but then the rasterization performance of the GPUs got to so much greater that the performance hit wasn't noticed as much. And as I said, there was other techniques implemented that reduced the hit. Uh, but I think it's a similar situation to, to what we saw with MSAA. Yeah, and it's... The 
the thing with all these sort of things is like any visual effects that you add into a game cause performance hits. Mm -hmm. And over time, obviously, games try and do more and more stuff. And it comes to a point like, let's, let's take some extreme example like Shadows, like a game with or without Shadows. It comes to a point where do you want to run a game with 700 FPS with no Shadows or do you want to run it at 100 FPS with Shadows? And, you know, the difference is so significant in terms of visual quality and 700 FPS is so ridiculous that, of course, you put Shadows into that game. You put good quality Shadows, the game looks significantly better. And... Mm -hmm. Over time, there's going to become a point where ray tracing is doing that for games, where the the visual quality is very significant, and without ray tracing, the performance is so ridiculously high that, of course, you just turn ray tracing on because why wouldn't you? You don't need to run a game at 500 FPS when you can run it at 100 FPS or 150 FPS and get good performance. So that's really where yeah. the future of this is going to be, where, yes, okay, Either we get a situation where the accelerators are so incredible that the performance hit is negligible, or standard performance gets so high that the performance hit is fine. But we're in neither of those situations right now. We're in the that's situation. Right. Like, uh, go, so go I was say that's why we, we've criticised it initially because in a lot of the games, I mean, Shadow of the Tomb Raider and something like Dirt Five are the worst examples. Uh, with something like maybe Watch Dogs Legion and Control being the better examples. But again, even in those games, it's, as you've said many times, like a tech demo almost. If you turn it on and you go looking for the reflections and where it has the most improvement to the visuals, you're like, oh, that's really cool. That that looks quite impressive. That's a neat feature. But then you go and play the game, and a lot of the time you're then no longer noticing that stuff. You're focusing on other things within the game. And I think that's the problem with ray tracing. It's just not impactful enough it doesn't transform yeah. the game like jensen sort of promised it what if you t it's basically like you want to be anywhere in the game kind of like with what you were saying shadows on or shadows off most games you can go pretty much anywhere in the game anywhere in the environment and the difference between shadows on and off is massive like it's it's huge like yeah trees and characters and buildings and vehicles and whatever all start casting shadows and it completely transforms the scene in a lot of games like uh, one game I've been playing a bit of, Fortnite, for example, you turn ray tracing on in that and you'll go into one of the, the towns and you might find a building with some some glass windows and there's a reflection there and you're like, oh, that's kind of neat. But you walk around the rest of the town, it's like the lighting's a little bit different but not massively noticeable. You go near the water, again, reflections, quite interesting, quite quite cool but then most of the game's on grassy hills or deserts and stuff, and there's, like, no change almost to the visuals. Again, lighting is slightly tweaked, but unless you're analysing side-by-side uh, screenshots zoomed in and you can spot, like, the, char the character lighting is a bit more realistic or a bit, bit better looking. But when you're playing the game, you don't notice that. What you notice is, in my, in my case, I'm playing at 4K with DLSS enabled, with a 3090, I was getting over 200 FPS at 4K. Enable ray tracing, it's like 60 FPS. And you notice that. Like, 60 FPS sounds great, but in a game like that, it's horrible. Like, yep. it feels so slow, so sluggish. And, yeah, you don't have to play at 4K, 1440p. The performance, it will be less noticeable. But the point is, for most of the game, when you're walking around, I honestly, the performance aside, I don't know if I have ray tracing on or off. Like, I have to go find a building and check the reflections and be like, oh, okay, it's on or it's it's off. Yeah, but that, the, that's the problem for me. That, uh, that's all down to, as well, the amount of ray tracing performance that these cards have. There's only yeah. so much to go around. There's, there's a bucket of ray tracing, and the amount of ray tracing game developers want to do is like a swimming pool's worth, and the GPU yeah. can only do like a small bucket's worth. So yeah. and, in the future, the that will be even, different. Yeah, and doing that small bucket still absolutely tanks performance. That's yeah. the problem. So you're getting, in my opinion, in most of these games, very little to no visual improvement. Um, no visual improvement for me is like a Shadow of the Tomb Raider or Dirt 5 in particular. And yeah, I, 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 I guess the poll says it all, though. Like, we've had this opinion since day one, and it seems like most people agree with us that these reviews really shouldn't be focused heavily on ray tracing because they're just not there. Like, just accept it. I think they're just not there. 
yeah, the, it's, the visual it's improvements. Yeah, it's a demo. The visual like improvements aren't nearly. Yeah, yeah. But it's going to come. Basically, it's, it, it's going to yeah. come down the track. It's going to be a few generations where we're getting much more performant cards. They can do more ray tracing, more acceleration. Developers have figured all this stuff out because it's two years on. They're still figuring stuff out when it comes to ray tracing. And at that point, it's going to be, you know, so many games have ray tracing. Everyone's getting in on it. It's going to be great. But just mm-hmm. right now, the performance just is not there. And again, it's one of those situations again, where, the, the, let's take a game like Watch Dogs Legion, for example. I've been playing that with ray tracing on just to sort uh-huh. of get a feel for it. And I think that... In a lot of that game, ray tracing does provide some level of visual improvement. Not always. Obviously, the reflections without ray tracing, they're still there, so they still look pretty good. Mm -hmm. But ray tracing is better in that game. But Mm -hmm. the issue with that is, like, ray tracing off performance, even with DLSS on, is not good. Like, it's well below 100 FPS most of the time, even at, like, 1440p Mm -hmm. or 4K on a high-end GPU. I'm playing on an RTX 3090. And with DLSS and ray tracing enabled with otherwise ultra settings, I'm often well below 60 FPS at 3440 Mm. by 1440, which is the resolution I play at. And maybe in the future there's this world where, yeah, the game, a game like Watch Dogs Legion is running at 200 FPS with with ultra settings but no ray tracing. It looks amazing. And then you turn ray tracing on and we're down at like 100 FPS but that's still very playable. It looks way better. We're getting better visual effects than we've got now with less noise. More surfaces are being affected. We're getting multiple effects in. That is the point where ray tracing is going to really take off. But in a situation where you need an RTX 3090 to get even playable performance with ray tracing it versus ultra settings, and where the game really isn't running at super high frame rates without ray tracing, ray tracing is just not going to be the feature for everyone. And I... Don't get me wrong. There's nothing like... I'm not going out telling everyone to turn ray tracing off because it's the most horrible feature ever. Personal preference, I'm playing with ray tracing on because I want to see what the visuals are like. I want to enjoy the visuals. There are plenty of gamers out there. But again, for it to be that mainstream feature for everyone that's used in every game, like a Shadows, which at one point wasn't seen in games, or a feature like anti-aliasing or like tessellation all common features in modern games ambient occlusion it's going to have to Mm -hmm. become we're talking years down the track and Mm -hmm. i wouldn't be buying an nvidia gpu for ray tracing i wouldn't be buying an amd gpu for ray tracing that's just that's just the way it is let's talk about this in two or three years once it becomes a big thing but quite clearly people are upset about not as much ray tracing coverage in our reviews and more focusing on vram which i think i think we agree on this is more likely to be an issue yeah, that's my take, and I think it's fair to say at this point that it is a vocal minority that's banging on about ray tracing and how we should have tested it more and all that sort of stuff. And we've given other reasons why we, we're waiting for the ray tracing implementations for RDNA 2 to mature a bit, and we'll continue to test it as we go. And we'll probably do, as we've done time and time again, a dedicated piece that focuses on ray tracing performance because we still see it as a bit of a niche thing. And we don't want to weight our reviews so heavily on it. And I think we've made the right decision because we did a poll, which well over 40,000 people have voted in now. And the overwhelming majority want to, us to prioritize standard rasterization performance, not ray tracing performance. Or that's their what they're prioritizing. So what we're prioritizing seems to be in line with at least about 80% of our audience. And I'd say it's even higher than that. Because it seems like a lot of people that said, I voted for ray tracing, the reasons they gave don't necessarily make sense. Either they misunderstood the question or they just misunderstand the technology. So a lot of people were saying, I voted for ray tracing because it's the future. And so I want to make sure that whatever GPU I buy now will be good at ray tracing in three years time when it's used in all games, which is obviously a flawed way of thinking about it because... And this is something important to note as well when we're talking about, say, RDNA 2 versus Ampere. The performance margins you sort of see now may get a little bit better in AMD's favor. In our opinion, it doesn't really matter because performance sucks for the most part with ray tracing enabled. Again, as you said, that's not to say that you should turn it off in all games, but for the most part. But anyway, the point is in three years' time, these GPUs are not going to be using ray tracing in games. Like, you're simply going to have to disable it because they're not going to be powerful enough 
for standard rasterization performance. You're going to be dialing down to medium quality settings. Like Yeah, that's right. It's like buying a GTX 980 and then expecting in 2020 to be able to play the late Watch Dogs Legion on Ultra. You're certainly not doing that. You're going for medium. That's now like a low-end GPU. <laughs> for this generation, that will be yeah. sort of entry-level performance. You see how low the 980 Ti is in the charts for our Ampere and our DNA 2 reviews. So you're buying ray tracing. If you want to use ray tracing now, you're buying a GPU to use ray tracing now. Like you're not buying it to to, to future proof and use ray tracing in two years. Because I assure you, you'll, you won't even be using ray, ray tracing on its lowest setting on these GPUs. Certainly three years down the track, perhaps two. It's, yeah, it's not going to happen. I think there's a lot of just... As- there's a lot of assumption with the future. Well, there's assumption from so many angles when it comes to the, the future thing. We've talked a lot about the AMD mm. optimization angle, but I think people are sort of, for some reason, I'm not quite sure why, assuming that the only thing that is going to get more performance intensive in the future is ray tracing. So people want to have you know, their cards so that you know all, all these games that have ray tracing they want their you know we want the car with better ray tracing performance because that is the only thing that's going to be impacting performance in the future but like, like but the reality the- is like what game looks exactly the same now and then in the future only has one single effect that's better like that's yeah. just not how like all elements to performance get more intensive over time with games like if you were buying like let, let's talk about a game that came out like Red Dead Redemption 2 that game is extremely performance intensive on ultra settings without ray tracing. Like, not even factoring oh, ray yeah. tracing. It does a lot of new stuff when it comes to rasterization to produce really stunning visuals on the ultra settings. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like if you bought like a 1080 Ti to run, let's say, for future proofing purchases, purposes. Could you have predicted like a Red Dead Redemption 2 on ultra settings coming out and absolutely destroying the performance on your card needing to run at medium settings? Like. It's kind of that's that is always how games have progressed in terms of performance. They do all sorts of things. More more NPCs, more AI is going to require more CPU performance. More textures going to require more VRAM. There's just all these different angles and ray tracing is just a part of that. So if the cards are not really getting 60 FPS in modern like a game like Watch Dogs 2 or Control with ray tracing enabled, why in the future are we going to get 100 FPS? 60 yeah. FPS is as good as it gets. It is only going to go lower than that. And then that's where your point comes into play, where if we're getting 60 FPS now with the 3080 and Watch Dogs at 1440p, let's say, with ray tracing enabled, a f- future impressive visual title in 2021 or 2022 is going to be running at 40 FPS or 30 FPS. It's not going to be running at 100 so. FPS or 60 FPS. So yep. that's why people need to be p- making their decision on what ray tracing does now. And that's not even factoring in the whole other argument, which is people are always saying, like, lots of games in the future are going to have ray tracing. Sure. How many of those games are going to be your Watch Dogs Legions and how many of them are going to be your Dirt 5s or Call of Duties? So, well, it doesn't really matter. If they're Dirt 5s and Call of Duties, they'll at least play at an acceptable <laughs> frame rate. It'll be pointless, but, but you'll at least be able to play them with it enabled. I think people, people are making these... I guess, like, there's nothing wrong with assuming that more games in the future are using ray tracing. Like, that's a reasonable assumption to make. But I think a lot of people are making the assumption that every game in the future is going to be a Watch Dogs Legion for ray tracing or a Control for ray tracing. And what we've even seen over the last couple of years when it comes to ray tracing is that the minority of games are in that group. Like, think of the games that have just released. Watch Dogs Legion, Call of Duty, whatever the extra names of that title are, which I forget, it's like Black Ops Cold War or something, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. We've got that, Dirt, so we've got Watch Dogs Legion, Call of Duty, Godfall, Dirt 5 is the just released Ray Trace titles. One of those games has impressive Ray Tracing, and that's Watch Dogs. Dirt 5, Godfall, and Call of Duty by all accounts use Shadows, which isn't that impressive. So I, I honestly am a bit baffled as to how people are extrapolating, like, suddenly we're going from a situation where a very small amount of games have impressive ray tracing to like next year, every single game is like mirrored surfaces with (laughs) ray tracing. Like every game is control or watchdogs. Like you can, you can guess that, but we're talking about going from like a 10 X improvement in terms of the amount of games with ray tracing, like what 5% of games have it now, let's say. If you're talking half of all games have ray tracing, that's a 10x gain on the percentage of games that have ray tracing support. 
But these are also, ve- these are very. Ag- I guess the point I'm making is these are very aggressive assumptions people are making, aggressive predictions that ray tracing is going to, within a year or two years, go from having virtually no adoption in a very select section of games where it's visually impressive to every game or half of all games have really impressive ray tracing. I find that quite hard to believe and quite hard to sort of see that happening. That could be the case in two or three years, three years, four years down the track. But to go from virtually no adoption to extreme adoption in such a short period of time seems very unrealistic to me. But mm. we'll see. Oh, also, isn't it very contradictive? So you're saying, I want to ensure that in the future I can enjoy ray tracing in games because it's going to be visually stunning and all that. So, oh, we've just spoke about why that's a flawed way of thinking, but this is the way some people are thinking. But then you're saying... I'm not really putting too much uh, emphasis on the VRAM capacity. Like uh, eight gigabytes will be fine. If I have to turn down textures, I will. And we're sort of saying, I think we uh, view on this aligns that textures are the most important thing or one of the most important things for visual quality. High quality textures just make it look photorealistic, whereas low quality textures make it look god awful. So the 16 gigabyte VRAM buffer thing you you basically textures don't hurt performance it's the, as long as you have the capacity for them so you yep. can turn textures right down you won't if you have enough vram you won't gain extra fps by turning the textures down if you crank the textures all the way up and you have enough buffer for that you won't see a hit to the performance so in future games if you have a 16 gigabyte buffer you can actually crank the textures right up and you'll still achieve nice playable performance Whereas with the ray tracing, you won't because it'll be not nowhere near powerful enough. So really, to your best chance of ensuring high quality visuals in the future is to have a large VRAM buffer. Yeah, that's like, right. That has a much higher chance of ensuring high quality visuals in three years time than slightly better ray tracing performance today that's questionable as to what the performance is like yeah. overall anyway. So anyway, that's it just seems a bit contradictive to me. To, yeah, well, it's always that sort of thing where... It's one of those prediction things, right? Like, Mm -hmm. we are predicting how this plays out very differently to clearly some group of buyers who are preferencing ray tracing performance. So that's sort of how the the reviews and stuff are informed. Like, people sort of just going, oh, why didn't you focus on ray tracing or why didn't you, for the AMD GPUs, why didn't you criticize AMD more for ray tracing? And I think from this explanation, and we've had a few questions on ray tracing now, you should have a fairly good idea of why we don't place as much emphasis on ray tracing as you might have. And if I guess if if you're a viewer and you're watching this and you're like, I'm really interested in ray tracing, that is why I'm buying Ampere over at AMD, for example, then you know, there's nothing wrong with you going out there and predicting that a significant portion of games is going to use ray tracing and that's what you're buying it for. It's just that we think that is kind of unrealistic. So Yeah, and we've already seen situations with VRAM in the past. Like, there are four gigabyte... Well, there's, there's even GPUs with a four gigabyte and an eight gigabyte model. Grab those today and then compare the image quality in games at acceptable frame rates between using eight gigabyte textures and four gigabyte textures and see how significant the difference is visually. And I think you'll agree that the difference between four gigabyte and eight gigabyte textures is more significant than what we're seeing from ray tracing in most games. Yeah, but you get that in but you get that in all modern games that use well over four gigabytes of textures. Yeah, so that that that's how I think about that one. I think as as well part of it is like the VRAM situation with these cards. It's 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 easier to predict that right now, or we're much closer to the point where it matters because we are seeing games on the knife edge, like we've talked about with Doom, Watch Dogs, those sort mm-hmm. of games, where it's not as much of a stretch for us and to say in the future that's going to be an issue. And generally speaking, we test and review things based on the now, like stuff that is happening Mm -hmm. right now. We're not interested in going well into the future and saying, oh, this is going to be three or four years down the track, a big deal. We, We always want to focus on stuff that's happening now and not making predictions because the prediction can be wrong, whereas data that's available now is just the data that's available now. It's much a much more solid foundation to base it on. 
And with ray tracing, again, there's just so many things, so many question marks about what it looks like in the future, how many games are supported, the performance, what the visuals look like, optimization for these things, that to produce a review and then make a bold prediction like 50% of games in 2021 are going to have amazing ray tracing and great performance, that seems like something that as a reviewer we probably shouldn't be making. Like that is mm-hmm. a too too far of a prediction and too bold to go into the future and say that <laughs> you should be buying a card based on these these claims and predictions that, again, are, are fairly unrealistic. And sure, mm-hmm. I'd be, I might be proven wrong in any year. Every single game has amazing ray tracing and it performs great, but that would be a significant departure from what we've got now that is too hard to predict as a reviewer and really what we, sh- I guess, shouldn't be doing uh, in terms mm-hmm. of our reviews. We always like to stay in the now. Okay, can we flash 6800 XT BIOS on 6800? Does it fry with the BIOS? <laughs> How come you didn't test 6800 with fans on max for maximum performance? Uh, do their fans only go up to 800, uh, 1800 RPM? Uh, okay, so with the, the BIOS flashing thing, haven't tried it yet. Uh, I've heard that the BIOS is now locked and you can't do that anymore because they're trying to... Uh, reduce the sort of fraudulent stuff we've seen on eBay and the grey markets where they flash AMD cards and they'll flash like a an RX 480 with a 6800 XT BIOS and advertise it as a 6800 XT and a lot of people get ripped off that way. So I've heard they're locking down BIOSes to avoid that. Whether guys find workarounds to make that happen, not sure on that one. Uh, So yeah, haven't tried it yet, but it seems like the traditional way of doing it isn't going to work anyway, which is probably why you haven't heard anyone doing it yet, or at least to my knowledge. How come we didn't turn the fans right up to max for maximum performance? Uh, because there wasn't really a point in doing that. Like it wasn't, it wouldn't have improved our overclock. We were limited by power, not by thermals. So yep. Um, we generally only crank the fan speed up if it's the thermals that are limiting us on a reference card because it will give us some insight into the overclocking headroom on AIB cards. So I think if the AIB cards end up overclocking a lot better, it would be because you have higher power to play with, higher power targets. We, we should have that answer uh, in the next few days. We may not necessarily be able to give you that answer depending on whether we get our cards in time, but I'm sure somebody somewhere on the 25th will have an AIB card. I'm tipping... Most of the American reviewers will get theirs in time it's just because we're in Australia and things take a bit longer <laughs> to get here or whatever the reasons are. Uh, and I think that was pretty much yep. everything. Oh, would you buy the reference model or an AIB card? Almost certainly AIB. The reference cards are perfectly fine, but I think for similar money, you will get much better AIB models. And again, it depends on the overclocking headroom, how much that's been improved, if there's a bit more... Uh, flexibility there with the AIB cards. So, again, yep. we'll, we'll know about that soon. All right. We're done. We are done. Two hours or something, the, the audio recorder is saying there. Yep. So, I did not know Tim and I could talk for that long together. Yeah, my, so, whole, uh, my voice is probably destroyed at this point. <laughs> I'm going to need to go into recovery. Yeah. <laughs> well, I haven't said, but I this time of year I get very bad hay fever. So, I, my throat's a bit swelled up, itchy eyes and a bit nasally in my voice. It makes it a bit hard to talk clearly sometimes. So I've had all the hay fever medication one person could have within a 24-hour period <laughs> at this point. Uh, but I got through it pretty well. Not too many, uh, too much of the sniffles while we went through that one. But yes, very dry, sore throat. So the cure for that will be to sit back, relax, and finish off my 3070 versus 6800. Big benchmark video for... It'll actually be tomorrow night now, won't it? So Hopefully, yeah. It depends when this video goes out, but yeah, hopefully it'll be... Ne- yeah, it should be day. if it all goes to plan. So make sure you subscribe for that because it will be the most comprehensive... Uh, what is it? Uh, 6800 versus 3070 benchmark nice. on the internet, I think. So it should be good. Three resolutions, whole heap of testing. Should be some good stuff. All right, cool. But other than that, we have Float Plane, Patreon. If you want to become part of the Hub Robux yep. community, ask questions that were answered in this video but for future videos also join us on discord where these questions were asked by our hard run box community you can do that so exclusive discord chat monthly live streams Tim and myself similar format to this but we just we talk about whatever and we answer your questions live that are popping up in the chat feed behind the scenes videos q a's anyway it's really cool if you're interested to check it out link is in the video description other than that i'm your host steve i'm your host tim and guess what See you again next time.